guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Breaking news, Spider-Man is Snoke. <laughs> also here, John Schnepp. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who watched Heroes yesterday. What's going on, guys? <laughs> also, you're Mark Ellis. I missed Heroes yesterday because I was at Disneyland for the Whoa. first time in like 25 years. I oh. went to Disneyland, and my God. Did that you place. do Hyperspace Mountain? I did Hyperspace Mountain. I did Star Tours. We went to Jakku, and then Jar Jar welcomed us to his Gungan Underworld. So it was like my dream Star Tours and my Nightmare Episode 7. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, guys. As happens sometimes, a little piece of news dropped before we, uh, after we finished all the show notes that you see here, uh, and we thought we would address that right now. We, there is a report going out right now that uh, Spider-Man, um, you know, who of course his rights are owned by Sony, whatever, but that Marvel Studios has now screened Civil War for the Sony execs for their, and in the report, their quote, notes and for their sign off of how Spider-Man is used in the movie. I thought that was interesting that that's happened. And apparently the, the Sony people are very, very happy with what they saw. On the one hand, it kind of reaffirms what we've already known. Like Spider-Man still very much does belong to Sony and they, they have to give their approval. But at the same time, it also kind of feels like it would just be a formality because you would assume that before they started shooting the movie that Marvel would submit the screenplay and the script and how it's going to be shot to the Sony execs so they knew in advance how he was going to be used and now they just sit back and watch and make sure everything's good. But the other interesting thing that this suggests to me is that this is probably very much, and it has to be, a two-way street. Because we know Sony, with this new deal between Sony and Marvel, Spider-Man can appear in the Marvel Cinematic Universe with their approval and sign-off and everything. But we also knew that this also means that Sony is now able to use some Marvel characters from time to time in their movies. And what this tells me is that this probably goes both ways. That now when Sony produces a Spider-Man movie that uses some characters, even if they're second level characters or first level characters or third level characters, Marvel is probably also going to have notes and approval process in those films as well. So I never really thought of it in those terms. And now that I do, I gotta tell you, this makes me even a little bit more excited. I'm excited to see what Sony does with Spider-Man again. Sony has given us some really great Spider-Man movies, and they've given us some other movies. <laughs> um, but knowing now that if they use Marvel characters in there, that this is probably two-way street, and Marvel's gonna be able to give notes and have approval on how the Marvel characters, I think this bodes very well for the future Spider-Man movies as well, and bodes well for how Spider-Man's gonna be used in the Marvel Cinematic Universe when you have a company now that is there as the you know the advocate for that character. I don't know, Schnepp, you heard about this. What are your first thoughts? My first thoughts are at least it's confirming without a shadow of a doubt that Spider-Man is in it for more it than a cameo. Because it, yeah, it was just him like, yippee, or flying around. They'd be like, all right, approved. They wouldn't, even, like, they wouldn't have a big meeting about it. So this is like, showing the new direction that the new character spider-man the re the remade spider-man is going to take in the marvel universe and in the new sony movie that's coming out in 2017. super exciting to know that i you know we heard that possibly captain america and iron man are going to go shoot a little scene we don't know what it's for but wouldn't that be great if they show up in the spider-man movie <laughs> Uh, that it bodes well, I think, for the spot, the new Spider-Man reboot. So I'm sorry. A little side note: just, this, is, this isn't that funny. Somebody just wrote in the code. The identity of Snoke has been revealed, and it's John Cena. But anyway, so <laughs> you, it's an it's a YouTube thing. Don't worry about it. Anyway, Mark, you heard about this Spider-Man stuff. What do you think? I certainly did, John. And it's my question that I have with any executive screenings: Did it get a standing ovation? <laughs> That's what we all want to know. I don't think the screening was that long, Schnapp. I don't think uh, Spider Man's going to be in that many scenes for Civil War, but it just, it, 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 you, it would, you would assume this hints at a very nice creative relationship between Sony and Marvel. And you're right, John, it is a two way street because Marvel definitely wants to know everything that's happening yeah. with their characters. And even the Spider Man character, Sony needed to see these scenes because they need to make sure that everybody's on the same page when they make their own standalone movie, that it is continuous from whatever happens in Civil War. So, yeah, it's exciting that they're being friends. 
Yeah, and it's nice to see it work out this way. And I'm sure Spider-Man's appearance in the movie is more than just a cameo. Like, right. we never thought it would just be a cameo. Like, you know, Captain America is sitting down and having a coffee, and you see Spider-Man on the back table also having <laughs> coffee. No, he's going to have a role. I just don't think it's going to be all that big of a role. All right, let's move on to the first official topic of the all day. All right. With Mockingjay Part 3 having already taken in over $520 million at the worldwide box office, the Hunger Games franchise is by far the most profitable series Lionsgate has ever produced. Now, even though Cat has fired her last arrow, it seems Liongate is eager to go back into the arena as soon as possible. At a recent event in New York, Lionsgate Vice Chairman Michael Burns said that the franchise will live on and on. If we went backwards, there obviously would be arenas. This is in addition to a previous statement by the CEO of Lionsgate, who stated that they are actively looking at some development and thinking about prequel and sequel possibilities. Mark, would it be a good idea for Lionsgate to produce Hunger Games prequels? Only if they like money. And if they do, <laughs> it's a very smart move to make Hunger Games. Anything in the Hunger Games universe, I like how he, how he likened it to we have arenas. And if you have an arena and inside that arena is anything in the Hunger Games universe, people are one. They want to go see this stuff. I think a prequel is more intriguing because I'd like to see how the world became what it was when we met Katniss and District 13. I don't know what you can do from a standpoint as far as... You could probably do a sequel, I guess, without giving away the events of the last movie if you haven't seen Mockingjay Part 2. But there's a lot of stories you can tell here. So it's not at the top of my wish list to go revisit The Hunger Games, but I know a lot of people love this story and the source material. So I think it's a good move. Yeah, now everybody knows that I'm not a big fan of the concept of prequels. There certainly have been ones that have worked. There have. But for the most part, philosophically, I don't like it. But... I've always been open to the idea of prequels when it comes to something like, say, Game of Thrones. Because you can mm -hmm. go back 200 years where, yes, it's the same world, and yes, it's kind of a, a prequel, but it's not the same characters. You don't have to wonder if, you know, uh, I, I don't know, name any one of the characters. You don't have to worry if that guy's going to live because you already know he does because you see him in the further films. That's why I kind of like the idea of this new Harry Potter franchise they're doing is that, yes, it's in the Harry Potter world, but Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them takes place like 60 or 70 years before the event. You're not going to see Harry or Hermione or, or Ron or any of these characters at all. So, yes, it's the same world. Yes, it's technically a prequel, but it still kind of works. I believe there's a lot of history here in, in the Hunger Games that you can go back 40 years or 50 years or whatever. Maybe you do have a President Snow. I mean, I, I don't know how far back they go. But I, for me, my favorite of the Hunger Games films was number two. And I think the most popular aspect of it was the arena stuff. Everything that had to do with the Hunger Games. And I think if you can go back to that, I think there's some possibilities here. Not a guaranteed success, but I think there's something here that can work. Schnepp, what do you think? Yeah, I wonder, I mean... Uh, you know, the Hunger Games definitely very inspired by Battle Royale. I wonder if they went back and kind of did an origins of how they thought maybe the Hunger Games the, would help the society and not become what it actually became, a right. very horrible, futuristic world. So that's my only fear is like, you already know how it ends. So it's like the interest of, for at least for me, is seeing like, you know, which weirdo was like, this is a good idea, you know, and seeing how that all, how the how the different houses all formed. I think that would make sense. But it's the same thing with episode seven. Why we're all excited about it is because we want to know what happened to that universe 30 years after we were all singing yeah. Yubnub on yeah. Endor. We right. don't know what went on. And it seems like, at least in Star Wars, a lot of stuff went down and there's new problems. New problems will arise in this world, too. Who's going to rise up and defend whoever the good people are mm -hmm. against the bad people? And if you did a prequel, who do you cast as President Snow? Jack Bauer, baby. Keith He's right Sutherland. there. Yep. He uh, wait a sec. Snow is Snoke. Oh, there we yeah. go. Oh, Snow, Snow is Snoke. Snow. Yeah. Now, what if they did this, too? I'm okay, too, if they go forward and they do a sequel. I would just want them to jump forward enough that it has nothing to do with Katniss. Because mm. that story's been told. So don't just jump ahead five years after the events of Mockingjay Part 2. Jump 40 years ahead, you know, where now there's new stuff going on in Pen M. Maybe, you know, one one of the districts is rising to power again. Maybe it's not District 1. Maybe it's District 8 or whatever. There's some interesting stories there to tell, too, but a prequel could work as well. All right, what's next? Next to the Oscars, the most prestigious award an actor can receive is the Screen Actors Guild Award. This morning, the nominees for the 22nd SAG Awards were announced. Here are your nominees. Outstanding performance by a male actor in a leading role. Brian Cranston, Trumbo, Johnny Depp, Black Mass, Leonardo DiCaprio, The Revenant, Michael Fassbender, Steve Jobs, and Eddie Redmayne, The Danish Girl. 
Outstanding performance by a female actor in a leading role. Kate Blanchett, Carol. Brie Larson, Room. Helen Mirren, Woman in Gold. Saoirse Ronan, Brooklyn. And Sarah Silverman, I Smile Back. Outstanding performance by a male actor in a supporting role. Christian Bale, The Big Short. Idris Elba, Beasts of No Nation. Mark Rylance, Bridge of Spies. Michael Shannon, 99 Hones. And Jacob Tremblay, Room. Outstanding performance by a female actor in a supporting role. Rooney Mara Carroll, Rachel McAdams, Spotlight, Helen Mirren, Trumbo, Alicia Vikander, The Danish Girl, and Kate Winslet, Steve Jobs. Outstanding performance by a cast in a motion picture. Beasts of No Nation, The Big Short, Spotlight, Trumbo, and Straight Outta Compton. John, what do you think of this list of nominees, and who do you think will win the SAGs? What a great list. What a great list. Now, uh, the outstanding male uh, lead actor category, the last two years have been stupidly packed. I mean, stupidly. You were getting Tom Hanks not getting nominated at the Oscars because it was that packed for the last couple of years. I'm not as packed as years previous, but some really good names. Um, I, I, it feels like it's going to be Michael Fassbender. Michael Fassbender is getting an awful lot of attention for his portrayal of Jobs. Even people who didn't like Jobs all that much, mm -hmm. everybody's like saying he's just crushed it. A lot of the critic groups are giving him their award right now. Leonardo DiCaprio's presence, well, I picked him in January mm -hmm. of this year. Leonardo DiCaprio this year for the Oscar. I'm starting to feel like maybe it won't be his year, but I think uh, you're going to see Michael Fassbender get that. I'm also totally behind Cate uh, Blanchett for Carol as well. Seeing Sarah Silverman get nominated is kind of interesting yeah. as well. Uh, for for outstanding performance by a supporting for a supporting role, I think you got to go with Michael Shannon for 99 Homes. That's just me personally. Uh, best supporting actress, Rooney Mara for me for once again for Carol. I'm going with all the actresses for Carol. And the best performance by an ensemble I have not seen The Big Short yet. So out of the ones I've got, I'm going to go with Spotlight. Mark, what about you? The Big Short is fantastic. I'm going to go with Spotlight for Best Ensemble. And that's where my complaints start with the snubs. Because nobody in Spotlight, none of the males in Spotlight, were nominated for anything. Whether they thought Michael Keaton was supporting or a lead, he got snubbed a little bit. You're right. The Best Actor category is packed. Matt Damon should have been on there somewhere, though. I would have kicked yeah. Buddy Bulger out of there and thrown Matt Damon from The Martian in there. That's just me. The Best Supporting Actor, I think it's going to to go to Idris Elba. I think it's really mm. cool to see Beasts of, of No Nation get recognized by the Screen Actors Guild. As a Netflix film, yeah. But I'm bummed that I didn't see Sly up there, man. I really thought him as Rocky Balboa could have made a difference in that. That would have been so exciting to see him. I think that I, I, I agree with your choices for best female actor and best or best female actor. Best female actress, best actress, best supporting actress. It's going to come from Carol. And you're right. I think Leo is doing it for the Revenant. I think he's going to, I don't care what the other award shows say. This award show says Leo's winning the SAG <laughs> and the Oscar. All right, Chef, All what right, about I, you? I'm going to argue with Ellis. I'm going to say, uh, no, Leo's <laughs> not going to win. I'm just, I'm going to say, uh, I think, uh, the Fassbender has got it in the bag. I, of all the performances I've seen so far this year, I mean, Jobs is not the best movie, but I feel his performance carried through and he actually, I felt like a lot of emotion coming out of him as Jobs, uh, less so uh, in Leo's performance as a Revenant. I, don't, I just think too much of his role was cut in ex exchange for nature photography. That's how I feel about the Revenant. But uh, Kate Winslet did a great job. I think Helen Mirren, it's great to see her n nominated twice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Idris Elba is definitely uh, my pick for uh, for the supporting role. Uh, Beast of No Nation was an incredible, insanely amazing film, and what a treat! If you have Netflix, you could see it right now. It's it's an amazing. They did a day and date release, so those would be my picks. And I was also surprised just looking at the list that I didn't see the name Tom Hardy somewhere because the guy worked his ass off this year. He was great in Mad Max. He was great in The Revenant. He played two dudes in Legend. I mean, right. he really worked a lot. It'd be nice to see him get recognized for something. Yeah, I'm not surprised we don't see him in there for Mad Max. I'm a little bit, uh, not even all that surprised for for not seeing him in Legend, considering the the reaction the, the mm -hmm. film is itself. But yeah, Matt Damon, the two big ones for me that are missing on this is, number one, Matt Damon, because I, be I do believe he will be in there when it comes Oscar time. I do believe he will get nominated. I don't think he'll win, but I believe he'll get nominated come Oscar time. And a lot of the critic groups, again, have been giving him a lot of attention for that as well. But the other one, too, is Sylvester Stallone. Mm -hmm. I, I, I cannot believe Sylvester Stallone's performance in Creed is not on this list. Especially when you consider, like some of the other names, like uh, Jacob Tremblay in Room was very, very, very good. But I would put Sylvester Stallone ahead of him uh, for that. Uh, uh, Mark Rylance for Bridge of Spies. 
he was very, very, very good. But I would put Sylvester Stallone in ahead of him. There, it's just I, I just have a hard time when you see what he did in that role. And hey, maybe you can make an argument. Yeah, but it's the only role he can really play. Whatever. That's not the question. The question <laughs> is who gave the best supporting role this year. And I really thought it was uh, Sylvester Stallone. So it'll be interesting to see how this works out. All right, folks, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Coming off back-to-back -back smash hits, it was no surprise to anyone that the Mission Impossible franchise was fast-tracking a sixth installment. We already know that Tom Cruise and company are bringing back director Christopher McQuarrie, which will make him the first director in the series to ever direct more than one installment, and it looks like another person is returning as well. According to a report in Showbiz 411, actress Rebecca Ferguson is signed, sealed, and delivered for part six. This will make her the first female lead in the franchise to return as well. Schnett by herself bringing back Rebecca Ferguson for Mission Impossible 6. It's a big buy for me. I think she was fantastic in Rogue Nation. She made the film so much more fun. She elevated with Tom Cruise and McQuarrie, that team. It's great to see that team coming back for another Mission Impossible. I'll be there opening night. I'm very happy <laughs> that she's going to be a part of it. Mark? Uh, I buy it as well. You know, they really, when you th look back and think about it, they did something really risky after Ghost Protocol because they didn't have Brad Bird come back. They didn't have Paula Patton come back. And everybody loved that movie. We liked them in that movie. So making Mission Impossible Rogue Nation was really risky. I mean, how are you going to top that? They managed to do it, and they're leaving the poker table. They're saying, you know, we're going to keep our director. We're going to keep our other star. And I like the play. Because out of all the Mission Impossible movies, even Ghost Protocol, which I adored, this is the one that I want to see a sequel to this story and these events that went down and the players in it so I mean I'm assuming Simon Pegg Jeremy Renner Alec Baldwin I'd love to see back too but yeah locking down Rebecca Ferguson huge buy for me massive buy and it is kind of staggering when we stop to think about the fact that yes it is weird that the Mission Impossible franchise five films in has never had a director return to do a second one mm. it's also kind of staggering when you think no lead female has ever come back. Now, Michelle Monaghan doesn't really count because her second appearance was just a quick cameo. I'm not, right. I can't even remember if she had any lines or not. So, absolutely. She was one of, Rebecca was one of the elements that elevated Mission Impossible 5. She was fantastic in it. And they just didn't give us another super spy woman who can kick ass. They gave us great backstory that we're all dying to know more of and set up a character that we want to see how she progresses moving forward. So this is a beautiful move on their part. Big buy for me. All right, what's next? According to a report in Deadline, George Clooney is getting close to assembling his cast for his upcoming directorial effort, Suburbicon. The story claims that Josh Brolin, Matt Damon, and Julianne Moore are all now in negotiations to join the project. The film is written by the Coen brothers and is described as a noir drama set in the 1950s in the vein of the Coen's breakout film, Blood Simple. Mark, would you buy or sell Suburbicon written by the Coens, directed by Clooney, and starring Josh Brolin, Matt Damon, and Julianne Moore? I'm going to buy it. Ashley, and I'm probably going to regret the purchase because <laughs> the men who stare at goats had a great cast and really, and it was based on source material. It really disappointed me. Monuments, man. God, I hate that movie. Every time I think about Monuments, man, I hate it more and more and more because I'm just not sure I can trust George Clooney as a director, even when he's blessed with a cast like what we just heard. It's written by the Coen brothers. And I like that, but I also was excited about Burn After Reading, which I believe they did, and George Clooney had a part in that film as well, and I hated that movie. So as much as I want to sell this, all the talent involved, I just got to think it's going to work for Clooney this time. Schnapp. Yeah, I'm going to buy it, and the Coen brothers is the big reason I'm buying it. I agree. Uh, several of Clooney's uh, last ventures weren't that great. Um, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind still is an amazing film. Right, right. Um, but, uh, I, yeah, this team, this group of, of actors, Coen brothers, George Clooney, Set in the 50s, everything just sounds, and Coen Brothers writing it, it has me intrigued. It sounds really fun. I don't even know what it's about, and I'm like, I can't wait to see it, so I'm buying it. Look, I'm totally with you guys on Monuments Men. That it, I didn't hate the film, but it, it disappointed. It absolutely disappointed. And Leatherheads, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, let's not forget. But, but that aside, like Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, Good Night and Good Luck, I thought was fantastic. Yeah. I thought mm -hmm. Ides of March was a very underrated film. I really enjoyed Ides of March a lot. So he's got, here's a director who can crush it. He's in a cat. I think he won. An, mm -hmm. Did he not win Best Director for Good Night and Good Luck? 
I'm not he sure. might, I'll have to look that I'd up. I'd have to get my research If not, he was at very minimum nominated mm-hmm. for that. He's a talented director. You had great writers. You had great actors. They've all had hits and misses. But this sounds really cool. Suburbicon, a noir thing set in the 50s. This sounds like right up the Coen Brothers alley. This sounds like it could be right up George Clooney's alley. So, well, hey, look. They've had bad days at the office. Maybe it won't work out. But at this point, I'm going to buy it. All right, what's next? One of the many things to enjoy about this year's Kingsman The Secret Service was actress Sophia Boutella, the blade-legged bodyguard for Samuel L. Jackson's villain. Now, according to a report in The Hollywood Reporter, Boutella is now in talks to star in the upcoming Universal Pictures film The Mummy as The Mummy. This report <laughs> is consistent with earlier reports that director Alex Kurtzman was looking to make the title character a woman this time around. John, would you buy or sell Sophia Boutella as The Mummy? Well, I mean, it really all depends on the direction they're going with the film. Film. If they have a mummy that's going to have a huge dramatic role in the film, like talking and all that kind of stuff, then I'm going to go, we have got no sample size for this girl to really to tell. And, and the performance per se, what few lines she had in Kingsman was just not enough for us to get a grasp of that. But if the direction of the mummy is that we want to have a very physically active mummy that can pull off action and do some things we've never seen a mummy in films do before, then she's kind of a great choice. She's kind of an inspired choice to do that. Not many people know about Sophia, but she also has a side job of uh, being um, Tiffany Smith's complete <laughs> doppelganger. <laughs> Look up some pictures of Sophia yeah. and Tiffany Smith and put them side by side. Tell me you don't get confused a little bit. But if they are going that direction of an action-filled mummy where the mummy itself is doing a lot of the action, I'm intrigued. And if that's the case, then she's the right choice. So I'm going to give it a buy for now. Yeah, I'm going to buy it. I mean, you're right. She they didn't, you know, she didn't have a lot of flexibility as far as line readings in the Kingsman. She did a lot of a lot of flexibility jumping around with these knives. So if she is a like a, an action star mummy type of thing. I don't know. You add Tom Cruise to the mummy. I instantly started thinking this is not going to be a talk fest. This is going to be a lot of action, but it's going to be in a different way than Brendan Fraser did his action. Yes, I think it'll be a different. It won't be a comedy style mummy. It'll be a horror action film. So with Tom Tom uh, Tom Cruise in there and adding her, she's also an action star. I think what you're talking about it makes sense. They're going to have a lot of action scenes, uh, so I'm buying it. It's the very first time I've wanted to unwrap a mummy. Usually you see a mummy, <laughs> you just want to run away from it. This time I'm like, let's see what's under there. Oh my God, she's beautiful. Why are we wrapping her up? It makes no <laughs> sense to me. Yet I'm going to buy it because I loved her in Kingsman and she didn't have a lot of lines, but she injected an energy into that movie that it needed from a villain character like that. Her and Samuel L. Jackson were great foils for what the action was going on with uh, with Eggy and with Colin Firth's character. So yeah, I loved her in that. I don't know if she'll have blade legs in the mummy, but I'm, I'm intrigued. I, it's not a huge buy for me because I haven't seen enough of a body of work to know how well she can be as an actress but as an action star she's got the chops all right folks well listen it is Wednesday which means it's time for us to talk a little bit of rewind brought to you by our friends at AMC theaters this is the part of the show that I affectionately refer to as the feeling old segment because we're going to talk about those movies that this week are celebrating their 10th anniversaries of release and their 20th anniversaries of release. So let's start off with this. Celebrating their 10th anniversaries this week, we've got The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and the award-winning film Brokeback Mountain, and celebrating its 20th anniversary this week, not the first one, but the sequel, Father of the Bride, Part two is 20 years old, and Steve Martin still looks exactly like he does in that poster, <laughs> which is kind of freaky. He has drunk the blood of Satan, apparently. So, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so Snap, these three films we got celebrating anniversaries The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Brokeback Mountain, and Father of the Bride, Part two. What stands out to you? The one that stands out most to me is The Chronic What Kills of Narnia. Of course, <laughs> uh, that, that one I went. And uh, I went inside their little broom closet or whatever, their little dresser. The wardrobe. The wardrobe, that's right. And it was, I, I really liked it. I liked Liam Neeson as the weird Jesus lion. I liked, I liked, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. That very first Chronicles of Narnia was a lot of fun for me. And that's the one that I remember. The other two, not so much. But no. the, the very first one was a really cool fantasy film for kids. So. Yeah, I surprisingly, I really enjoyed that first line, The Witch in the Wardrobe. I thought... It was similar enough to Lord of the Rings, but very unique enough yeah. at, at the same time. It was a very different kind of film. And I loved the way it was directed. The action was surprisingly good. The effects were surprisingly yeah. good. And the performances out of these young actors was actually really good as well. I enjoyed the film a lot. And let's not talk about the films that came afterwards. Uh, Brokeback <laughs> Mountain, it's the film that really put Heath Ledger on the map. 
I mean, everybody who's a respectable, serviceable, solid Hollywood performer, he's, he had had a lot of films under his belt, but it's when he did Brokeback Mountain that everybody went, oh, wait a minute, he's got, in his gas tank, he's got the capability to reach astounding heights. And then, of course, that then led into what he did with the Joker. And I love Father of the Bride, too. I don't care what anybody says. I love that movie. I still laugh at it whenever I watch it. So, like, all three of these films stand out to me. What about you, Mark? I mean, anytime you got Steve Martin and Martin Short in the same movie, I'm going to love it, regardless yeah. of the quality of the film. And, yeah, I like Father of the Bride, too. Brokeback Mountain's one that stands out for me because I still haven't seen the movie yet. I know I said I would a couple months ago. I'm working on it, guys. I'm busy. I'm going to see Brokeback Mountain very soon. But when that movie came out, I was a young comic and a lot of comedy clubs, a lot of open mics, a lot of bar shows, and a lot of people just kept making Brokeback Mountain jokes, and it got so just hacky and just say, oh, this is a gay cowboy movie coming out. Man, that's crazy, huh? I just hated seeing the comedy that was based on Brokeback Mountain, but Brokeback Mountain itself got so much. It was, it was great to see a movie like that come out and get recognized by the Academy for what an achievement it was, and Jill and Hall and Heath Ledger, from all accounts, were great in it. Ashley, have you seen any of these films? I have. Which you know, stand out to you? I really love this segment usually because it makes me like remember how much younger I am than you guys. But <laughs> today, I feel old. <laughs> Chronicles of Narnia and Brokeback Mountain, 10 years old. Yeah. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling old with you guys today. You know, Ashley, 33 isn't that much younger than me. <laughs> I am not 33. Oh, There's nothing oh wrong God, with that. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, the memories I have with this, I love Chronicles of Narnia. So much fun, such a fun setting. And then Brokeback Mountain, I remember, I mean, this brings me back because I have a good friend who at the time wasn't out yet. And just kind of seeing that movie with him, like I had a feeling, I've known him since second grade, and I had a feeling that maybe- Was he your boyfriend at the time? He was not my boyfriend okay, at the time, but a good friend. And now he's like, he's out and has a boyfriend and it's just like so crazy to think that that was 10 years ago know, and like how nuts. much we've progressed kind of yeah, really. in the US as far as how comfortable people are with coming out and stuff and wow 10 years ago that's crazy <laughs> but yeah I feel old today guys I feel old. what kills me too is that father if if I because when I was first reading about the the anniversaries when I saw father of the bride it's like okay I guess wait it's not even father of the bride it's father of the bride two <laughs> yeah. turning 20. give me a break we can all age like Steve Martin oh we'll my fun, god yeah. he's I mean seriously he has not aged well yeah. okay well he hasn't aged I think the deal with Satan he made is that hey I'm gonna get gray hair when I'm nine years old yeah. right <laughs> and then I'll just be able to stay looking he's like had this gray hair since the jerk the jerk mm -hmm. he had gray hair yeah. yeah he looks he looks just a little bit older than he was in the mm -hmm. jerk yeah so it's funny because one of my all-time favorite comedies is dirty Rotten scoundrels Same and it's here. funny that's like love that 20 movie. plus years yeah. old and he's got pure white hair and yeah. he's the young guy yeah. in the movie pure white hair it's kind of crazy all right folks we reached out part of the show for mailbag listen if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address in the show just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com now we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show take some of your live questions for those of you who are watching this show live right now jump on twitter Make sure you're following us at Collider Video and tweet on in your questions. Ashley will pick some out at the end of the show. But for now, let's get to those mailbag questions. So Ashley, what do we got? Handyman writes, hey guys, love what you guys do on mailbag. And I'm also a huge fan of Jedi Council. Being that I am a proud Canadian like yourself, John, yes. I was wondering who you feel is the best Canadian actor in the business today. And also your pick for best Canadian actor of all time. There's a lot of talent coming from the North. <laughs> Keep up the great work. And I'm counting the days until your Force Awakens review yeah i cannot wait to do a review for that um <laughs> best I, I would say the best canadian actor working today it would come down to three people one would be ryan gosling uh second would be rachel mcadams and the other would be ryan reynolds who oh, i still think ryan reynolds is a tragically underrated mm. actor as far as go how good of an actor he is if you have not seen him in Oh, God, what is it? It's the one where he's in the box the whole movie. Oh, uh, Buried. Buried. Yeah. And the woman in gold he was great in, too. And he was great in definitely, uh, not yeah, definitely, maybe. Mm -hmm. He was great in that as well. Check out, especially Buried, if you want to see him, like, take it to, like, Academy level stuff, watch him in that there. But then you got names, like, in comedy, you got, like, Seth Rogen, you got uh, Nathan Fillion, you got Ellen Page, you got uh, Michael J. Fox, of course, one of the all-time guys. You got Jim Carrey, you got Donald Sutherland, Will Arnett, Emily Van Camp, um, you've got Anna Paquin, Evangeline Lilly. But my all-time favorite, my all-time, oh, and of course, you got the Shat. Yeah. You got William Shatner, of course. Okay? <laughs> but uh, my, me personally, I still think, still in my heart, all-time favorite uh, Canadian performer is Lorne Green. 
uh, who, this is going way back a ways. He mm. first made his big mark. He was a household name when he did Bonanza, which was like one of the longest running television series in history. And then, of course, he was Adama Captain Adama in mm -hmm. the original Battlestar Galactica, which was a coup d'etat at the time for like a sci-fi weird show mm -hmm. that then got Lauren Green. He was also a Shakespearean stage play at performing all that kind of stuff. So best today's is a three-way debate. Gosling, Reynolds, or McAdams. Uh, the best all time for me personally is Lauren Green. What about you, Schnepp? Who would, who would you say is like the best Canadian performer today and who would be your favorite all time? You weirdo Canadians. There's so many. <laughs> I mean, as I was looking it up earlier. I was like, man, there's a lot of these back bacon, you know. They're all over there. the place. Oh, they're, they're did all I say over. Nathan Fillion? Nathan uh, Fillion's got to be a fan there's favorite. There's so many. My all time favorite Canadian actor or actress is William Shatner. I, the he's Shat. A, the Shat. He's the, my favorite actor from a, as a little kid growing up watching all those Star Trek reruns. I just, I love Captain Kirk and I thought even his overacting was so much fun. The, the fight scenes. Dun, 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 you know, he's the double hand. Yeah, the, oh. So <clears throat> kids in the hall, all, all those guys are incredibly talented and they're all Canadian. So I, I but for me, it's the Shat. Shatner, still the record for most intergalactic <laughs> STDs. Uh, <laughs> as far as Canada goes, Canada, what I love about Canada is that they always make me laugh. Anybody that comes from Canada is hilarious. So in addition to names you said, which Jim Carrey would probably top my list as far as all time, but Michael J. Fox is right up there, as is Martin Short. Nobody is funnier on a late night oh, talk yeah. show than Martin, Martin Short, Short's Martin Short and Mike Myers. And Brian Adams has one of the best voices in rock and roll history. Everything Not the hardest I rocker do. in the world, but man, that, that guy has got pipes. <laughs> and you, you, you know, you just remind me, of course, Mike Myers. I can't believe I didn't mm -hmm. say him. But then you're looking at the entire, like the, the whole SCTV, John Candy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, John Candy. Uh, Eugene, Eugene Levy. Levy. Uh, uh, who's the guy who was the vampire dude? Uh, it was Joe. Um, Joe Flaherty. Flaherty, yeah, thank you. Flaherty. Joe Flaherty, um, the 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 girl who plays the aunt on My Big Fat Greek it's not Wedding. Catherine O'Hara. No, no, but Catherine O'Hara is yeah. another Canadian. Oh, uh, Aykroyd. Uh, Dan, Dan Aykroyd. Uh, They're all can, of, everyone's Canadian. Yeah, like, like, and just they just walk SCT. amongst us, and I we know. don't even know. Shit. It's like you gotta oh, take the glasses off. They live <laughs> Canadians. <laughs> I'm from the invasion of the body structure. He's one of them. Yeah. <laughs> if you see Canadian. sticky fingers on somebody, that's maple syrup. <laughs> that, that's your team. All right. Is that what? <laughs> anyway, what's next? Destin L. writes, hey, Collider crew, awesome job on the show. John Campia frequently says that Russell Crowe is the second best working actor after Daniel Day-Lewis. I want to know who everyone else's pick, top picks are. Keep up the good work. Yeah, and you know what? Like, Daniel Day-Lewis, who I, I think... I mean, he's he's the man. Daniel Day-Lewis is the man. Every time he's going to appear in the movie, he just becomes, before anybody's seen a single frame, he's the odds-on favorite to win the Academy Award. But he is, there was a period of time when, for me, Russell Crowe supplanted him as the number one guy just because it's, who's the best working actor right now? And he's, <laughs> he goes years in between film. Get another year or two, I'm going to take Daniel Day-Lewis off that thing because I just won't qualify him as an acting, right. uh, working actor He's a cobbler. Again. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a shoe cobbler. I mean, so let's just wait for him to come back. But those those have always been my top two, at least for a lot of years now. Those have been my top two. Mark, who would you put at the top of that heap? Of course, best working actor and the people I get most excited to go see in theaters. In addition to that list would be Denzel Washington yes. and Michael Keaton. I'm so happy both of them are back working in a lot of movies. Denzel never really went away, but Michael Keaton, we went years without seeing Michael Keaton, and people oh, were like, man. where is Michael Keaton? Is he retired? And now he's back in the spotlight. Oh. And, uh, oh. I, I could not be happier about it. I love watching that, dude. I love Michael Keaton too. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm really glad that the SAG Awards they nominated that as the group, a group because that really feels they like they have an ensemble cast. Yeah, the yeah. ensemble cast that feels like the best one so far for me. Uh, for my for my pick would be Gary Oldman, is one of yeah, my favorite he's great. actors. Every role he picks, he always picks a different kind of character to play, and he's really great. Even if the movie's not as great, he is great in that movie, and. Uh, Let's see who else. Do Michael Fassbender for me is like oh, yeah, the most current great. actor. Every single role he's picked over the last like five or six years, it's been completely different. He's challenged himself. Twelve Years a Slave, going to Prometheus, going to uh, Jobs. I mean, ever to now Macbeth. Macbeth. I mean, Assassin's Creed. And he's great in all of them. And he's 
I mean, so to me, he's, he's the top male actor right now. Speaking of Gary Oldman, did you ever see, I don't know which late night show, whether it was uh, Conan or one of the other guys. Gary Oldman did that little fake public service announcement, announcement commercial where he's on the basketball court. Have you seen this? No. Look this up. It's Gary oh. Oldman talking about, he's, he's an actor, right? And he's talking about athletes trying to act in movies. And he starts <laughs> yelling and swearing. Ch check it out. Just go on. If one of you guys know where it is, throw it in the, throw a link in the comment section. I got to show it to you guys after we're done the show Definitely because it'll make you laugh your guts out. It's hilarious. All right, folks. I said we would take a little bit of time to take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, tweet to us, and make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Suck up to Ashley. She's the one picking out the questions. So, Ashley, what have you selected today? Abe Gonzalez writes, how do films get distributed to movie theaters? Email, delivery, the cloud? Thanks. Yeah, it's um, it's changed a lot over the years. It used to be these big reels of mm, films yeah. put in these cases. Heavy, heavy. Heavy, very heavy, and transport. I mean, just the expense of distributing films used to be astronomical because just the transporting yeah. these physical creating these physical reels and sending them out the digital age has uh secured a lot of that there are theaters that have the capability of just downloading the stuff but i believe for the most part it's all now delivered on these big hard drives right these they're now still physically delivered to most theaters i know some theaters do it a little bit differently but i think that's the standard right now is they just deliver these big solid hard drives so you guys know any different yeah you can d either deliver the hard drive or they can upload it so that's kind of the delivery system now which is amazing how quickly that's transferred i was an usher for many years and carried gigantic reels <laughs> up to the uh, projectionist and there was a a lot of a lot of uh reels you know for one film i believe it was like, sometimes it was eight of these containers it's pretty fantastic and now we're just like yes here it is i've uploaded did you receive it yet yes the 500 gigs have been received it's so amazing and it's all true it's encrypted so no one else can play it it's it's fantastic we live in the future that's what makes me nervous is that is like i hope batman v superman isn't in a cloud somewhere where like somebody can just steal it they just plug in the right thing and they're like oh fine, i found it now i just have to decrypt it and people know how to do that so yeah i like the i, I still want physical delivery to be a part of how movie theaters get it because it adds security Oh, and by the way, thank you guys. A bunch of already put in the YouTube link in there for that video. Awesome. So just check that out. <laughs> and uh, thank you. And of course, somebody mentioned, why didn't you say Norm MacDonald? Norm MacDonald. I love him too. Oh, I think course, he's great yeah. too. All right, what's next? DJ Mike Zero writes, did you guys see the trailer for the BFG movie? Um, it. I noticed it right before we started the show and I, we made the last minute decision that we're going to hold that one off, our reaction to that till tomorrow's show. So watch tomorrow's show for our reaction to the BFG trailer. All right, C. Byrne writes, most influential actors slash actresses still working today? Oh, influential. I mean, you, you got to look at guys uh, like, well, he has not officially retired. So I'm going to throw Jack Nicholson in there, even though mm -hmm. he hasn't done anything in, uh, in a while. Bill Murray is still, in, even though box office wise, he's not exactly a draw anymore, but he's still an incredibly influential guy. I believe George Clooney is one of the most influential ones. Meryl Streep, you have to put right near or at the top of that list. Kate uh, Blanchett. Kate definitely. Blanchett is, is another huge one. What about, what do you think? I, I don't know anybody that's working in the business today that didn't either see Star Wars or Indiana Jones when they were a kid. So it's yeah. got Harrison Ford's got to be right up there. Yeah. yeah. All right. What's next? Christopher Woodburn writes, are you guys still doing the commentary videos for the Star Wars trilogy before The Force Awakens? <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. Here's what happened. We A number of weeks ago, we said, okay, we are going to do these. And if you haven't checked them out, look at them on our YouTube channel. We've already done Knocked 3 out. We've done a commentary video for The Phantom Menace, uh, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. We've got those three knocked out. Uh, and we, our goal was to get all six Star Wars movies knocked out before we got to Star Wars The Force Awakens. However, um, our schedules are so crazy that finding time that all four of us, plus Dennis, who does all the tech for it, are available for a two hour chunk of time or two and a half hour chunk of time when we're not shooting other things or one of us has got something else to do, has proved very, very, very difficult. We were actually just talking on set here uh, before we started rolling about when can we shoot A New Hope? We gotta shoot A New Hope. We're looking at some dates, so it'll be soon. Keep your eyes open. As soon as we know when the next one will be up, we will let you guys know. Do you guys have anything you wanna add? Coming soon. Pizza party. <laughs> That's what's happening. We're going to see sell it. me with a pizza party. Yeah. He's like, no, we can do this, this, this. He wanted to do it like three in the morning. But he's like, ah, but it could be a pizza party. And anytime I hear P and P together, I'm going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Nick DeStrosiers writes, best comic duo, Peg Frost or Rogan Franco? Mm. 
Oh, I'm gonna go Rogue yeah. and Franco. I I love Peg and Frost yeah. together, but I have not loved every. Like for instance, Paul. Paul to me was a disappointment. Right. I, I wasn't really. Now, granted, uh, Edgar Wright didn't direct that right. one. Uh, I wasn't so big on Paul. So I'm I'm. But for whatever reason, when Franco and Rogan are together on screen, <clears throat> even when they're doing something that isn't funny, I laugh. And so. By a very thin margin, I'm going to put Rogan and Frank out there. What about you? I'm going Peg and Frost by the slightest of margins simply because you're right. I might even laugh harder at Seth Rogan and James Franco in a movie. Like, say, take, take The Dictator. I laughed my ass off for 20 minutes. Yeah. And then when they actually had to tell a story, it lost a little bit of something to me. Whereas Peg and Frost are funny and they can tell a cohesive story in a set amount of time. So I'm just, just as from a movie making standpoint, if it's even in comedy, I'm going to give them the tiebreaker. You know, it's funny. I mentioned Paul. I believe Seth Rogen did the voice of Paul. Ooh. Did he not? Yes, yeah, he did. Yeah, right. a little bit of that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, Freaks and Geeks, uh, Franco and Rogen, spaced Peg and Frost spaced wins that's why they win. <laughs> that's good that's gonna be your deciding yeah factor that's there. my deciding factor because they're both so evenly uh, mm -hmm. dispersed in the films yeah. but the space is my favorite you win either way really yeah. all right what's next solo junior writes what is the best movie marathon uh the original star wars trilogy uh i mean look it's hard to go wrong with the with the original three <clears throat> lord of the rings trilogies as well because that really does flow as one cohesive one movie when you watch them back to back what about to the back. extended edition lord of the rings isn't that like 17 hours or yeah, something? It's some, it is something it's like 12 or 13 yeah. hours like seriously when you watch it that way so i mean look you, you can do well watching a marvel marathon mm -hmm. as well very broken up though and so a little bit inconsistency there but I, I will always stick with the original Star Wars trilogy. Watching those back to back is the best thing ever. What about you guys? I think you watch Battle Beyond the Stars, Krull, <laughs> Masters of the Universe, <laughs> rock out like a weird 80s freak fest science fiction uh, you know, type thing. You know what? I mean, nowadays we live where we, we just like we just binge watch like 13 episodes of Jessica Jones. Jones. So I don't even know what this <laughs> these movie marathons. We're marathoning stuff all the time. I'm like trying to catch up on different TV shows all the time, trying to marathon them. So it doesn't matter to me anymore. It's like, oh, you you could watch Marathon Scream Queens. That's an incredible yes. TV series. And it's really funny. It's funnier than you think. So I don't know. I, I think you can marathon anything. Treat yourself to a Jaws marathon. You can yeah. watch the biology of a great white <laughs> shark start out as somewhat realistic into something that can survive electrical shock and burns into something that is in 3D into something that has ESP that will follow the Brody family all the way to the Bahamas where great white <laughs> sharks cannot exist yeah. to kill one old lady. It's phenomenal. As long as you have Michael Caine there to try to defend them. Okay. okay. Oh, I thought of another Canadian actress because Ashley's sitting here. Uh, the, the half Asian girl from Pretty Little Liars. Oh, uh, um, um, you mean. Uh, uh, Sinead, uh, uh, not Sinead. <laughs> on, um, oh my God. Stunningly. Putting me on the spot. <laughs> I don't think that. Um, sh um, oh my gosh. Shay Mitchell. I don't okay, think yeah. she's half Asian, though. Oh, is I'm she? I'm not really sure. She looks Filipino to me. I'll have to look into what her I'll ethnicity have to look is. Gorgeous girl. Absolutely yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous girl. All right, let's take two more questions. Um, Mr. Woolhams writes, hey, why have so many movies underperformed this year? Well, I mean, you've got a number. Of, look, every year you're going to get a list of movies that underperform and a list of movies that overperform. There's been a lot of movies that have overperformed Jurassic this year's too. Jurassic World overperformed. Oh, massive! Yeah. Fantastic! Yeah. Furious Seven way overperformed. I mean, yeah. so you're you're getting a lot of that too. Look, why does any movie ever underperform? Because it either a bad marketing campaign, it didn't appeal the way they thought it was going to appeal, it was a bad movie, bad bad word of mouth got out. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into it. So there have been a couple of movies this year that we have watched and thought, I'm surprised how good this movie was because the marketing look, made it look so bad. Right. There have been a number of those this year. Like a good current example is The Good Dinosaur. The Good Dinosaur had a lot of drama revolved around it. It was pushed back a year. They practically went back to scratch to redo everything. And then the trailers, you, had, you really didn't have any idea what is this movie even about. They had that one cute scene where in the trailer where the comic goes over the head and the dinosaurs look up. Okay, that was cute and funny, but that's right. all there was. We, nobody had any idea what that movie was about. So there's a plethora of different answers for a plethora of different movies. No two are alike. Schnepp, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of the, a lot of it's down to like, did it hit the audience? Did it hit? Did whatever the studio is trying to do, their marketing, the actors, the story, and the way they presented it, did it actually resonate with the audience? And when you when it when no one goes to see the movie, that means it didn't resonate. It doesn't matter how many people said it was a good film. If it doesn't actually crack through and make that difference, people are going to go see what their friends tell them. Oh my God, this was so much fun! Like Jurassic World, people were like waiting to see 
the return to Jurassic Park. Everyone wanted to see that. They cut together a really good series of trailers. Word of mouth, whether the critics were mixed or not, enough people were like, I want to go back because it looked fun. They included what all of us wanted was that ride. We all wanted to go to Jurassic Park. And that's in the movie. So by giving what giving the audience what they wanted, that's the success. Yeah, don't send that tweet to Universal because they're not going to read it. They're too busy counting the billions of dollars <laughs> that they made this year. But there were some standout disappointments, and remarkably so. And you mentioned Rock the Casbah and Gem and the Holograms mm -hmm. came out very close within each other. And it was horrible marketing campaigns on both, and the movies just end up not being that good anyway. That's why they were so, so bad. Plus, sometimes when you have big blockbusters that are coming out, if people want to save their money for Hunger Games, they're not going to go see a movie the week or two weeks before or star wars they're not going to go see a movie i'm very interested to see how the box office ends up this weekend mm -hmm. you have in the heart of the sea and the big short are people going to want to go see in the heart of the sea when they know everybody's trying to see star wars the next week right that's a good question. all right last question of the day all right richard hernandez writes do you think we will get the crow remake by 2020 that is a great <clears throat> that's a great number I like 2020 that is a that is a great great number that because if you go 2018 easy over but you're 2022 easy under i think if we cast adi shankar right now <laughs> as the crow terrible <laughs> finish your thought finish your thought we might have a hit uh i will i'm gonna go over not by much but i'm gonna go over I'll go under. I, I think you'll see something by 2020. You know what's going to be funny is that it's going to be in production before 2020. And it's going to be announced for like the first because it probably is a January movie. Let's not kid ourselves with how many, many delays there's been. It might not be great. It'll probably come out January 1st, 2020. In all seriousness, I think it's under. I think it'll come out like 2018. I think they'll get it because it's not, it's not, a, complica for years, but it's not a complicated thing. Once they get over what the issues that they've been having, they can knock it out and have it out the, that Halloween. So right. It's not a heavy special effects film. Well, that will do it for us, folks, for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great <clears> films <throat> playing right now at our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. While you're here, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. we got tons of stuff going on here at the channel. We just put up a, a new top 10 worst video game movies of all time list that Mark and I did. Yes, <laughs> make sure you go back and check that out. we got a whole bunch more coming out. we got Heroes. we got Jedi Council. we got Mailbikes. Lots of stuff subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to www.tdoslwh.com and uh, get a digital download for your friend over the holidays. Support independent film. Sitting over here on my right, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? Uh, at 5150Ellis on Twitter and Instagram. See all my pics from Disneyland yesterday. Just a huge smile the entire 24 hours. And this this Friday, this Saturday, I'm sorry, this Saturday and Sunday, I'll be at the World Famous Comedy Store in Hollywood. And of course, sitting in the end, our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, what's it like being 33 and where can people find oh you online? Oh my gosh, I am not 33, barf. You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. How to successfully offend all 33-year-olds everywhere. No, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying. Except barf. As long as just barf, you know. What's wrong with barf? And, and, I, was, and I was kidding. Ashley has a one full year before she turns 33. So. I hate you all. <laughs> and of course, you can find me on uh, Facebook and on Twitter. Simply follow me at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.